The WOR Special Features Division presents a program in observance of the annual award by the Drama Critics Circle of New York to the best play of the season. The award for the 1947-48 season went to Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire. And on this program, you will hear several scenes from this prize-winning production with Jessica Tandy, Kim Hunter, Marlon Brando, and Carl Malden playing the roles they created on Broadway. Mrs. Irene M. Selznick, producer of the play, is here with us, and Elia Kazan, who directed the drama, will accept the award for Mr. Williams, who is in Italy. The presentation will be made by John Mason Brown, distinguished critic and president of the Drama Critics Circle. Mr. Brown. Let the first robin come bob, bob, bobbing along, and all of us can be certain, even in the contemporary world, of one thing. The season for prize-giving is upon us. There are Americans more loved and less abused, more loving and less abusive, too. But even we, regardless of our mounting ages, seem susceptible to the spring. For then it is that we meet, as we did on Wednesday last at the Algonquin, to vote upon what, in our group opinion, has been the season's best play on Broadway. Our sessions in the past have often been stormy enough to make the Executive Council of the U.N. look to its laurels. Last Wednesday, however, we met without raised voices, bloody noses, pierced hearts, or even wounded feelings. A group of Quakers could not have been friendlier or less warlike. This year, it was Terence Rattigan's moving and well-written drama, The Winslow Boy, which was chosen as the season's best foreign play. The circle's choice for the season's best American play was A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. It is the second time a drama by Tennessee Williams has been honored by the reviewers, the first time being in 1945 with The Glass Menagerie. A Streetcar Named Desire is a fascinating and unflinching study of the disintegration of a southern school teacher who has not confined her professional activities to the classroom. This school teacher is a woman who, well, in deference to the radio's extreme sensibilities, can perhaps most safely be described as having lost her amateur standing. It is her descent into madness that Mr. Williams follows. He writes of her and her days in New Orleans with both force and sensitivity. Mr. Williams passes no moral judgment on his school teacher. He does not condemn her. He allows her to destroy herself and invites us to watch her in the process. The Circle is proud to bestow its prize again upon Tennessee Williams. He, alas, is in Europe at this moment. As a matter of fact, just this morning from Rome, the Critics Circle has received from Mr. Williams a cable reading to all of you my deepest and most heartfelt thanks, which I will try to express in good work since I cannot in words. But though Tennessee Williams is absent, the Circle is proud to have Ilya Kazan present to accept its award in Mr. Williams' name. Mr. Kazan is one of the finest directors our theater knows. It was he, after all, who directed All My Sons, which won last year's Critics' Prize. His direction of this year, on a streetcar named Desire, is as sensitive and creative as Mr. Williams' writing of the play. Mr. Kazan. Thank you, John. Of course, I'm most sorry that Tennessee himself can't be here to be honored. On the other hand, I do have an opportunity to say a few things about him that I could never say to him or even if he were listening. You may not know it, but every director secretly prides himself on his ability, generally unappreciated, he believes, as a play constructionist or script expert. I was no exception. But unfortunately, in the differences that Tennessee and I had in rehearsal, most of which time has mercifully erased from my memory, experiment in the first audience proved him right too often for my comfort. I also found that while I didn't know as much as I thought about playmaking, he knew considerable about staging plays, particularly his own. I found him an inexhaustible source of stage business. I finally arranged to keep him tethered to the footlights and have his food and liquid refreshment brought him to him. I wanted him there constantly and used him as a cook uses a superbly stocked larder. The significance of this might escape you unless I add that too often the only thought the director has for the author after a couple of days of his company at rehearsals is, oh, please, where can I send this man for two weeks while I stage his play? But not so here. Tennessee knows as if by instinct that the theater is the collective expression of many arts and crafts, 
and it conveys what it does to the audience through a full repertoire of these means. Words, of course, but action as much, and also music, props, paint and light, sound and color. And so I'm sure today Tennessee would want me to express on his behalf his great debt not only to the actors who are seen and applauded, but to other craftsmen as well. To Joe Mazzina for a setting which successfully and superbly houses both the action and the spirit of Streetcar Named Desire. And to Lucinda Ballard, who found just the right thing to put on the back of each actor to make him meaningful and still humble and right. And now, speaking for myself, allow me to note that for the second year in succession, a young and comparatively fresh playwright, playwright has been honored in this forum. Both Arthur Miller and Tennessee Williams are at the threshold of their careers. And it makes me particularly happy that our New York theater is so richly replenishing itself, is so fertile and growing. It makes me proud to be part of it. Thank you, Mr. Kazan. The center is also pleased today to have Mrs. Irene M. Selznick present. Mrs. Selznick had the discernment and the courage to produce a streetcar named Desire. We would like to hear it from you, Mrs. Selznick. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I'm humbly and gratefully aware that my brief career in the theater has been blessed with great good fortune. First, that rare artist, Tennessee Williams, entrusted me with the production of A Streetcar Named Desire, which was a true privilege. Then to secure the extraordinary talents of Ilya Kazan made it seem that the guards of the drama were watching over Streetcar. To prove it, they brought us the brilliant performances of Jessica Tandy, Marlon Brando, Kim Hunter, Carl Mould, and others of our cast, and the splendid contributions of Joe Mildina and Lucinda Ballard. For all of them, and for the many others to whom the production was a labor of love, I want to express the happiness and appreciation we feel to be permitted to share in this tribute to Tennessee. But to you, Mr. Brown, and your eminent colleagues, I must speak bluntly. I simply love the critics of this year. Thank you, Mrs. Elsnick. And now to the play itself, with Mr. Kazan serving as narrator. The Sabbath being the Sabbath, and the radio being the radio, A Streetcar Named Desire is not an easy drama to present on the air of a Sunday afternoon. That is one of its virtues. I trust that what follows will not be too inhibited or diluted to suggest the full strength and power of A Streetcar Named Desire when it is seen on the stage. Blanche Dubois has come from Laurel, Mississippi, to visit her sister, Stella, in New Orleans. To reach Stella's home, Blanche has taken the streetcar named Desire, which bangs up one narrow street of the French Quarter and down another. She finds her sister living in a shabby two-room apartment with her Polish-American husband, Stanley Kowalski. Stanley has no background and little education, but he does possess a strong animal magnetism. And Stella is so deeply in love with him, in spite of the contrast between them. Oh, stop, Tutti Frutti. Oh, Stanley. Hey, what's all this monkey doing? Uh, Stan, I'm taking Blanche to Galatoire's for supper and then to a show because it's your poker night. Hey, how about my supper? I'm not going to Galatoire's tonight. I put your cold plate on ice. Well, I ain't this just dandy. I I'm going to try to keep Blanche out till your poker party breaks up because she's very sensitive and I don't know how she'd take it. Oh, you better give me some money. Here, help yourself. Hey, where is she? She's in the bathroom soaking in a hot tub to quiet her nose. She is terribly upset. Uh, over what? Well, she's been through such an ordeal. Yeah, well, that singing doesn't sound like she was upset. Well, she is. Dan Blanche says we've lost Belle Reeve. What do you mean, a place in the country? Mm-hmm. Well, how? Oh, it had to be sacrificed or something. Yeah, well, uh, let's have a gander at the bill of sale. I haven't seen any. Oh, what do you mean? She didn't show you no papers, no deed of sale, no nothing like that? Well, it seems like it wasn't sold. Well, then what was it, then? Give away to charity? She'll hear you. Well, I don't care if she hears me. Let's see the papers. There weren't any papers. She didn't show any papers. I don't care about papers. Uh, have you ever heard of the Napoleonic Code, Stella? No, Stanley. I haven't heard of the Napoleonic Code. No, no. All right. Code. Will you just let me enlighten you on a point or two? Yes. In the state of Louisiana, we have what's known as the Napoleonic Code, according to which that what belongs to the wife belongs to the husband also, and vice versa. 
Well, you know, it looks to me like you've been swindled, baby. And when you get swindled on the pole, the honor I get swindled, too, and I don't like to get swindled. Look, there's plenty of time to ask her questions later. But if you do now, she'll only go to pieces again. I don't understand what happened to Belle Reed, but you don't know how ridiculous you're being when you suggest that my sister or I, anyone else of our family, could have perpetrated a swindle on Now, where's house? the money if the place was sold? Not sold. Lost. Lost. You're lost, huh? Yeah, no, no. Look at, look at all these clothes in her trunk. Well, you think she got the, them out of teacher's pay? Hush, Dad. Well, will you look at these fine feathers and furs? After, what is that? This is a solid gold dress, I believe. Now, look at this one. Oh, please, Dad. And what's this here? Genuine fur fox piece a half a mile long. That, where, uh, where are your fox pieces, Stella? That's ridiculous, Dad. Uh, what do we got here in this jewel box? <laughs> look at that. Pearls, ropes up them. Well, now, what is this, sister? Is a deep-sea diver? Stanley, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, bracelets, solid gold. Uh, where are your pearls and gold bracelets, Stella? Be still, Stanley. Are you kidding? Like, uh, here, here's your plantation, and right here, what's left of it. Oh, you've no idea how stupid and hard you're being. I'm going outside and get some air. Oh, well, go ahead. You come on out with me while Blanche is getting dressed. Not uh, since when you give me orders. Are you going to stay here and insult You're her? darn tootin' I'm going to stay here. Look, Stan, try to understand and be nice to her. Admire her dress and tell her she's looking wonderful. That's important to Blanche, her little weakness. Yeah, yeah, I get the idea. Hello, Stanley. Hi, Blanche. Here I am, all freshly bathed and scented and feeling like a brand new human being. Well, that's good. Where's Stella? She's outside getting some air. How do I look? Look okay. Many thanks. Well, looks like my trunk has exploded. Yeah, me and Stella was helping you unpack. Well, you certainly did a fast and thorough job of it. Well, it certainly looks like you raided some stylish shops in Paris. Yes, clothes are my passion. Yeah, uh, what does it cost for a string of furs like that? Why, those were a tribute from an admirer of mine. Well, he must have a lot of admiration. In my youth, I excited some admiration. But look at me now. Would you think it possible that I was ever considered to be attractive? You look so okay. I was fishing for compliments, Stanley. Look, no, I don't go in for that stuff. What stuff? Compliments to women about their looks. I'm, I never met a woman yet that didn't know she was good-looking or not without being told. You know, and there's some of them that give themselves credit for more than they've got. You know, some men are took in by this Hollywood glamour stuff, and there's some men that are not. I'm sure you belong in the second category. That's right. I cannot imagine any witch of a woman casting a spell over you. That's right. You're simple, straightforward, honest. A bit on the primitive side, I should think. To interest you, a woman would... Lay her cards on the table. Well, I never cared for wishy-washy people. That's why when you walked in here last night, I said to myself, my sister has married a man. Of course, that was all I could tell about you at the moment. Blanche... In the state of Louisiana, there's such a thing as a Napoleonic Code. They, according to which, whatever belongs to my wife is also mine, and vice versa. Oh. Cards on the table. Well, that suits me. I know I fib a good deal. After all, a woman's charm is 50% illusion. But when a thing is important, I tell the truth. And this is the truth. I haven't cheated my sister. Nor you, nor anyone else, as long as I... All right, where are the papers? In your trunk? Everything I own is in that trunk. I keep my papers mostly in this tin box. Yeah, and what's them underneath? Those are love letters. Yellowing with antiquity. All from one boy. Let me see them. <gasps> Give those back to me! Now, I'm just going to have a look at these first. Uh, the touch of your hand is... Uh, uh, don't pull that stuff! Well, what are they? Poems! A dead boy wrote them. I heard him the way you'd like to hurt me, but you can't. I'm not young and vulnerable anymore, but my young husband was. Never mind about that. Give them back to me. Well, take them. Well, what's so special about them? I'm sorry. Everyone has something he won't let others touch because of their, their intimate nature. Here are the papers you want. Right. Uh, who was that? It's Ambler and Ambler. The firm that made loans on the place. Well, then it was lost on a mortgage. That must have been what happened. No, I don't want no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, what is the rest of them papers? There are thousands of papers stretching back 
hundreds of years affecting Belle Reeve. I hereby endow you with them. Take them, peruse them, commit them to memory. I think it wonderfully fitting that Belle Reeve should finally be this bunch of old papers in your big, capable hands. Weeks pass, and Blanche has become a fixture in the Kowalski household, with tension constantly mounting between her and Stanley. Knowing she must find a way out, Blanche clutches eagerly at the possibility of a romance with Harold Mitchell, a young man who works with Stanley. One evening, Blanche and Mitch return after an evening at an amusement park. I, I guess it must be pretty late and you're tired. Mitch, see if you can locate my door key in this purse. When I'm so tired, my fingers are all thumbs. Here, is this it? No, honey, that's the key to my trunk, which I must soon be packing. Why, you mean you're leaving here soon? I've outstayed my welcome. Oh, is, is, is this one it? Eureka! Honey, will you open the door? Well... I guess you want to go now. Can I, uh, I mean, well, can I kiss you goodnight? Why, do you always ask me if you may. Well, I don't know whether you want me Why to or not. Why should you be so doubtful? Well, that night when I parked by the lake and kissed Honey, you, you told me that... it wasn't the kiss I objected to. I liked the kiss very much. Honey, you know as well as I do that a single girl, a girl alone in the world, has got to keep a firm hold in her emotions or she'd be lost. Lost? Uh, I like you to be exactly the way that you are. Because in all my experience, I have never known anyone like you. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? Oh, no, 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 honey. I, I'm not laughing at you. <laughs> Come on in. The Lord and Lady of the House have not returned. We'll have a nightcap. Let's see the lights off, shall we? Uh-huh. Uh, you, you want a drink? I want you to have a drink. You've been so anxious and solemn all evening. We've both been anxious and solemn. And now for these last few remaining moments of our lives together, I want to create what of ease. <laughs> I'm lighting a candle. That's good. So we're going to be very bohemian. We're going to pretend that we're sitting in a little artist cafe on the left bank of Paris. <laughs> here, here, I found some liquor. Just enough for two shots without any dividends, honey. There. Oh, oh boy. That's good. <sighs> Sit down. Why don't you take off your coat and loosen your collar? Oh, no, no, no. I, well, I, <laughs> all right, if you say so. This is a nice coat. What kind of material is it? Oh, it it's a very lightweight alpaca. Oh, lightweight. Wait, alpaca. Uh -huh. A man with a heavy build like mine has to be careful of what he puts on him so he don't look too clumsy. Well, you're not the delicate type. You have a massive bone structure and a very impressive physique. I thank you. Blanche. Blanche, guess how much I weigh. Oh, I'd say in the vicinity of the 180. Oh, no, no, no. I weigh 207 pounds, and I'm six feet one and one half inches tall on my bare feet. Oh. Without shoes on, and that is what I weigh stripped. My goodness, that's awe-inspiring. <laughs> well, my weight is not a very interesting subject to talk about. What is yours? You guess. Well, let me lift you. Oh, Samson. Well, go on, lift me. Hey. Oh, well? My... You're light as a feather. <laughs> well, you may put me down now. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Well, unhand me, sir. Oh, Blanche. Now, now, Mitch, Mitch. No, Blanche. Mitch, just because Stanley and Stella are not home is no reason for you should you, you shouldn't behave no, like a I, gentleman. I, I tell you, Blanche, I just just give me a slap whenever I step out of bounds. Well, that won't be necessary. Why, you're a natural gentleman, one of the very few there are left in the world. No, I, no I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm severe or old maid school teacherish or anything like that. It's it's just well. Well, what? I guess it's just that I have old fashioned ideals. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. oh, where's Stanley and Stella tonight? Well, they've gone out with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble upstairs. Uh, you're an old friend of Stanley's. Well, we was together in the 241st. Has he talked to you about me? Well, why do you ask that? Well, don't you get along with him? That is putting it mildly. 
If it weren't for Stella about to have a baby, I wouldn't be able to endure things here. Well, he isn't nice to you? He's insufferably rude. He goes out of his way to offend me. No, Blanche. Yes, honey? Blanche, how old are you? Why do you want to know? Well, I... I talked to my mother about you, and she said, how old is Blanche? You talked to your mother about mm, me? Yes. Why? Well, I, I told her how nice you were, and I liked you. Were you sincere about that? Oh, you know I was. Well, why did your mother want to know my age? Well, um, my mother is sick. Oh, and... I'm sorry to hear that badly. Well, she won't live long, maybe just a few months. Oh. And, well, she worries because I'm not settled. She, she wants to see me settle down before she... You love her very much, don't you? I think you have a great capacity for devotion. You'll be lonely when she passes on, won't you? I understand what that is. To be lonely? I loved someone, too, and the person I loved, I lost. Dead? Mm-hmm. A man? He was a boy. Just a boy when I was a very young girl. When I was 16, I made this discovery. Love... All at once, and much, much too completely. It was like you suddenly turned a blinding light onto something that had always been half in shadow. That's how it struck the world for me. But I was unlucky. And with his death, the searchlight that had been turned on the world was turned off again. And never for one moment since has there been any light stronger than... This kitchen candle. Blanche, you need somebody. And I need somebody, too. Well, could it be you and me? It could be. Oh, Mitch. Sometimes there's, there's heaven so quickly. <laughs> Several weeks pass, and the relations between Stella and Blanche get progressively worse, in spite of Stella's efforts to keep them on a friendly basis. But as Stanley comes home to to dinner one night, he finds Blanche, as usual, in the bathroom, soaking in a hot tub, and singing to herself. Well, the temperature the temperature is a hundred on her nose, and she's soaking herself in a hot tub. She says it cools her off for the evening. Well, I got the dope on your big sister, Stella. Stanley, stop picking on Blanche. Uh, you know, she has been feeding us a pack of lies here. No, I don't, and I don't want to hear any more. She has, however. But now the cat's out of the bag. I found out some things. What things? Yeah, there are things I already suspected, but now I've got the proof from the most reliable source, which I have checked on. Well, please tell me quickly just what you think you found out about my sister. <clears throat> okay. Line number one. All this squeamishness that she puts on there. That, uh, you should know the line that she has been feeding to Mitch. You know, that he thought that she'd never eat but more kissed by a fella. You know, Sister Blanche is no Lily. What have you heard and who from? Our supply man down at the plant has been going through your town of Laurel for years, and he knows all about her. Yeah, and everybody else in the town of Laurel knows all about her. Because she is as famous in law as if she was the president of the United States. Now, this supply man stops at a hotel called the Flamingo. What about the Flamingo? She stayed there, too. My sister lived at Belle Reve. Uh, This is after she let the place slip through her lily white fingers. She moved to the Flamingo, which is a second-class hotel, and it has the advantages of not interfering with the private and social life of the personalities there. Now, the Flamingo is used to all kinds of goings-on, see? But even the management of the Flamingo was impressed by Dame Blanche. In fact, they were so impressed that they requested her to turn in a room key, honey, for permanently. And this happened a couple of weeks before she showed here. minutes later, Blanche finally appears for dinner, and Stanley tells her she is to pack her things and go back to Laurel the following day, and he gives her a bus ticket he has bought for her. 
Later that evening, he takes his wife to the hospital as the baby's expected momentarily. While he is gone, Mitch shows up and tells Blanche in no uncertain terms that he's through with her. And why? As soon as he is gone, Blanche feverishly searches through her wardrobe. And when Stanley returns, he finds her dressed in an elaborate but crumpled white satin evening gown, preening herself before her mirror. Stanley! Yeah, it's me, Blanche. How's my sister? She's doing okay. And how's the baby? Well, the baby won't come before morning, so they told me to go home and get a little shut-eye. Does that mean that we're to be alone in here? Yeah, it's just you and me, Blanche. Hey, what have got all them fine feathers on for? I received a telegram from an old admirer of mine. Oh, yeah? Anything good? I think so. An invitation. To what? A cruise of the Caribbean on a yacht. Well, what do you know? I've never been so surprised in all my life. I guess not. It came like a bolt out of the blue. Uh, uh, who did you say it was from? An old bow of mine. Oh, sure. I want to give you them white fox fur, please. Mr. Shep Hunter. I wore his fraternity pin my last year at college. I hadn't seen him again till, till last Christmas. I ran into him on Biscayne Boulevard. And then, just now, this wire invited me on a cruise of the Caribbean. The problem was clothes. I yeah. tore into my tongue to see what I had that was suitable for the tropics. Well, it just goes to show you, Blanche, you'll never know what's coming. When I think how divine it's going to be to have such a thing as privacy once more, I can weep with joy. Yeah, this uh, millionaire isn't going to interfere with your privacy, now. This man is a gentleman. He respects me. What he wants is my companionship. A cultivated woman, a woman of intelligence and reading, can enrich a man's life immeasurably. Physical beauty is passing, a transitory possession. The beauty of the mind and, and richness of the spirit and tenderness of the heart. I have all these treasures locked in my heart. I think of myself as a very, very rich woman. But I have been foolish, casting my pearls... A swine, huh? Yes, swine. Swine. And I am thinking not only of you, but of your friend, Mr. Mitchell. Mm -hmm. He came to see me this evening. He dared to come here in his work clothes. He repeated slander to me, vicious stories that he'd gotten from you. I gave him his walking papers. Oh, you did, When huh? he came back, he returned with a box of roses, begging my forgiveness. He implored me to forgive him. But some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. Uh, was this before or after you got the telegram from Texas? What telegram? No. No, after. Yeah. As a matter of fact... Yeah, as a matter of fact, there wasn't no wire at all. Oh. And there was an old millionaire. And Miss didn't come back with roses because I know where he is. There's not a darn thing but imagination and lies and conceit and tricks. And uh, look at yourself. Like, look at yourself in a sworn-out Mardi Gras outfit running for 50 oh. cents of some rag picker. Please. You know, I, I've been on to you from the start, and not once did you pull the wool over this boy's eyes. You come in here and you sprinkle a place with powder and spray perfume, you stick a paper lantern over the light bulb. And lo and behold, the place has turned into Egypt, and you're the queen of the Nile, sitting on your throne, swilling down my licking. You know what I say? Ha-ha! <laughs> did you hear what I says? Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> I'm going into the bathroom and get ready for bed. Operator, 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 give me long distance, please. I, I want to get in touch with Mr. Shep Huntley of Dallas. He's so well known, he doesn't require any address. Just ask anybody. No, wait, wait, please. I, I No, I couldn't find it right now. Please, please understand. No, wait, operator, operator, never mind long distance. Get me Western Union. There isn't time to... Western Union, Union, take down this message. In desperate, desperate circumstances, help me. Caught in a trap. Caught. Oh, Stanley. What's the matter? Do I interfere with you? You know, come to think of it, maybe you wouldn't be bad to interfere with. Stay back. Don't you come toward me another step, you or know I'll... what? Something awful will happen. It will. What kind of act are you what putting kind... on now? Don't, don't! I, I'm in danger. <laughs> You smashed the bottle for So I could twist the broken end in your face. I bet you would do it. I would. I will. Well, oh, you want some rough house, sir. All right, let's have a little rough house. Not that bottle top, you tiger. Drop it. We've had this state with each other from the beginning. The 
WOR Special Features Division has brought you the presentation of the annual Drama Critics Circle Award to the best play of the 1947-1948 season, A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. The award was made by John Mason Brown, president of the Drama Critics Circle. The entire broadcast was under the direction of Jock McGregor. You also heard Mrs. Irene M. Selznick, the producer, and several scenes from the play. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.